Live from the CNBC studios in Washington, D.C., McLaughlin, a spontaneous, unrehearsed discussion on today's most interesting issues and personalities. And now your host, John McLaughlin. CNBC's Peter Bonds is up on the hill, and we're going to call upon Peter right now to give us a state of affairs. Peter? Hi, John. The uh, House is, uh, is going through the final impassioned speeches and arguments for and against NAFTA. The House will vote on the agreement sometime in the next half hour or so, and the President will get his victory. That, according to uh, uh, sources both in the opposition camp and in, in, in the uh, pro-NAFTA camp, uh, a, a key uh, labor lobbyist I ran into in the hall about an hour ago acknowledges defeat uh, in fighting against NAFTA, says the President is going to win this one. Right now, the vote count looks at to be about over 220. He needs 218 to pass. We've got the uh, AP, uh, AP uh, star here. His name is, uh, he, I'm sure you know him, his name is John King. King. John, what's the, what's the latest from the AP that you hear? We had 228 public commitments as of about dinner time, 6 o'clock this evening. And uh, there are also 5, 6, maybe as many as 10 Democrats in hand who will vote no, I assume now, who would have voted yes if Clinton really needed them. So he's fine. I think he's very comfortable. My guess is the 228 will hold. Maybe he'll lose one or two of those, but looks like he's going to win by 10, maybe 12. Uh, Peter, are you still there? Yes, I'm here, John. Peter, what's the mood up there? Well, clearly there is a look of defeat on the uh, NAFTA opponents' faces. Uh, uh, Bonnier, David Bonnier, the majority uh, whip from Michigan, who was the, uh, leading the fight against NAFTA, just finished his speech, and frankly, he looked like a beaten man. I was talking to uh, one of the uh, aides to one of the top NAFTA opponents and, uh, and lobbyists in this effort a little earlier. Uh, he uh, actually, I don't know if this is spin control, but it was very interesting. He said, you know, we really never thought that we would get this far anyway, and, uh, and they were surprised. He said that they had as many votes going into yesterday as they did, and they were shocked that the president waited this long to uh, cut all these deals to nail down the final vote. That's not true. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not true because uh, I think Labor made a very serious miscalculation. I think they thought that NAFTA was going to be an easy target, uh, that the uh, public opinion polls showed early on that the NAFTA was not very popular. Uh, I think Lab Labor made a very big mistake. They took their chips, John, and they pushed it to the middle of the table, and uh, they expected to rake in uh, uh, the winning pot, and uh, I think that they have uh, suffered a significant defeat. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't believe what uh, that spin, that is spin control. The Labor rhetoric was so close to the bone telling the president that he would be abdicating leadership, that kind of talk, telling the members of Congress that if they voted in favor of NAFTA, then they could depend upon label to marshal forces to defeat them. That's very, very hardball, and Labor probably alienated Capitol Hill. Would you not say? Well, I think that they did uh, brew some feelings. I talked to one con uh, California member today who uh, has been 100% Labor voting record. Uh, and this member said, uh, you know, they, um, uh, this was a very unfair, and I'm, I'm, I didn't take them seriously. And that's part of Labor's problem. Because when they say, we're going to run candidates against you, there's not a single member who takes that seriously. Because what are they going to do? Defeat their old friends and, uh, and, and uh, elect a Republican? It was always a hollow threat. But it has earned them some, some bad will, no doubt about it. I would think that Banya, if he looks sad, as uh, Peter says, uh, he should look sad, because he's a huge loser. He mobilized... Uh, he mobilized his resources, his apparatus, as the whip against his president, right? And that's certainly going to be felt for a long time to come. Don't you think Banya's a huge loser? Sure, he has the majority of the support in the House, Democrats, so he'll stay for now. But he, he was out last week saying he had 222-plus right. to vote. Um, we knew some of that was bravado, but still, he put his credibility on the line, and he lost it. I think by... He was trying to give cover to some of those on the fence to try to get them to come to his side. And for the few who did, who now feel embarrassed by this, they're going to have him on the spot. Lucky for him, they don't do leadership elections until they come back after the next year. Yeah, because I've heard from uh, some people on the Hill, some Democrats on the Hill, that they'll never vote for him in any leadership position again. Well, you've got to remember, however, even though this was a defeat for him, the majority of the Democratic caucus, which is what chooses the leaders, voted against NAFTA, will vote against NAFTA tonight. So he was not taking a position that was out of step with a lot of members of his own party. I think it was the way he did it. 
I do his, too. His prose was also very muscular, the way Labor's mm -hmm. was. And Gephardt, you notice, was was quite different mm -hmm. until the end, until the last week. In the last week, he came on and was a bit more. Uh, he did a rally on the Capitol along with some labor leaders the other day, just at the very end. But most of all, he was a good Democrat, and he said right up front, right. "I'm going to oppose this, but I'm with this president 99% yeah, of the time." He, and he, he stayed out of the way. His argument also took a strange shift. I mean, an, an unexpected shift. I interviewed him. And for the entire half hour that we talked about NAFTA, most of it was on NAFTA, he took the position this would be bad for Mexico. It's unfair to Mexico. Mm -hmm. We're not using the carrot and the stick properly to make Mexico come along democratically. But very little, in fact, in fact no arguments about loss of jobs in the United States, which is a real cutting edge issue. It's been, uh, Gebhardt has been singularly ineffective in this because he makes us rather odd Yeah, but argument. De designedly so? I think in part, yes. I think he... He has national ambitions in a way that Bonnier does not. Bo David Bonnier is a congressman from suburban Detroit, right. a lot of auto workers and other blue-collar workers in his district. His constituency is against this. He was voting and speaking for his constituency. Gebhardt, if he wants to be a national leader, has got to think in very different terms and has got to think about issues like the national economic picture. But I think, you know, in the end, all of this talk uh, didn't really matter very much. I think the reason why the president's going to win tonight is because presidents always, almost always win votes like this. You worked in the White House and you know that. It's not just that you have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of things to give away, but when a president looks you in the eye and says, I need you on this vote, now you can't do this every time, but when you do it on a key vote like this, I just never thought there was a way this guy could lose it. Don't you think, though, uh, that, that uh, Clinton deserves a special credit because Republicans thought that he would take a very tepid position towards it? And on the contrary, he came out with all guns blazing, did he not? Well, the Republicans thought he would. I think the bigger dynamic is that Labor thought he would. I mean, Newt Gingrich is praising him. That alliance won't last past tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. Bob Dole is praising him, and that might last a little better on health care, but not very long. The reason David Barney will survive is because Clinton loses those two. He needs somebody who can count in the House. I think Labor's miscalculation was that Clinton would duck from the fight. And Clinton decided he would not duck from this fight. And now the balance of power in the Democratic Party, he settles now with Labor and makes peace because he needs to, but he does not his terms, not there. Whoever timed APEC to be coming the day after the NAFTA vote was singularly inspired. Because it must have moved a lot of Democrats to it, vote it, for him. It definitely did, John. I talked to a lot of uh, the vote counters and the strategists today who said the single most effective argument we had was saying you cannot send your president out there, who represents all of us, Democrats and Republicans, meet with the Japanese prime minister, the prime minister right. of, uh, of China, the new uh, prime minister of Canada, and cut him off at the knees. You can't do that. We'll be right back. Coming up in our next half hour, by the way, Samuel Rai, a salesman, President Clinton, as I just said, <laughs> heads for a meeting with top Asian leaders tomorrow to try to pry open their trillion-dollar market. Will he succeed? We'll ask our guests, Senator Larry Pressler and Gary Huffbauer of the Institute for International Economics. That's in the next half hour. We'll be right back. We need a of America's working man should be the centerpiece of the Republican Party. Now, that great... The poll question was, is passage of NAFTA a crucial test of the president's leadership? 55% say yes. What do you think of that, John King? Uh, had he lost, it would have been a crucial test of his leadership because all he had to do in this fight is come up with 100 Democratic votes. Republicans gave him the rest. If you can't get 100 out of 258, you're neutered as the leader of your party. I think he'll do that, so he'll be okay. And now, is it a great test of his leadership? It's a big win, and uh, as long as the economy doesn't go in the tank, I think it'll be long forgotten. Do you, you agree that it's a big win? I do, because I think he, uh, uh, he really worked very hard on this. Tom Foley today, the speaker, was saying that I've never seen a president work quite this hard. One of the things he finally learned, brought Tom himself out of the closet, right. didn't he? <laughs> As it were. I think that, um, uh, I think that uh, one of the things we've learned about Bill Clinton, John, is that he, the guy's got a lot of toughness and he's got a lot of tenacity. He puts his mind to something, which he doesn't always do. But when he focuses, the guy is really tough and he's good. And he worked very hard on this. And um, I think success breeds success because the next time people go up against Bill Clinton, they know if he's focused yeah. and if he cares, They've got a, a formidable adversary. So in that sense, yeah. I think he, uh, he's won some points on this. Uh, go ahead. A lot of his negative polling is based on the fact that people don't think he stands for anything, and they don't think he has a backbone and will get into a fight. Here he stood for something that was outside the mainstream of his own party, and he got into a good hard fight. It's not enough to take him over the top, but I think it will give him, give him a little bit of a foundation now to build on. And 
when you go substantively through the year, he's got a lot of accomplishments. Uh, politically in the polls, he's had an awful year. The telephone number is 800-752-CNBC, and the fax number is 202-467-0601. Do you think that Clinton damaged himself in that he signed letters promising to repudiate campaign opposition to GOP congressmen based on their support for NAFTA. He didn't quite say that. First of all, we haven't seen the letters yet, but uh, what he, is, what he is, has promised to do is not make NAFTA an issue against Republicans. Right. And um, he's not saying that the other Democrats can't do it or that uh, the, the labor, labor can't do it, but what was really happening, it was part of, of, of the last couple of weeks' strategy. So many members were coming to the White House and saying, look, I'm going to pay a political price for going with you. You've got to give me some insurance. You've got to give me some protection. That's part of the reason why they debated Perot, to try to generate some enthusiasm on the other side. And this letter was part of that strategy, because a lot of Republicans sitting out there saying, you know, Labor's going to beat the hell out of me in the next election if you don't give me some cover. So, um, What about the Democratic activists? Are they going to take offense at uh, those assurances of Clinton to the, to the Democrats? Sure, to the Republicans. Republicans. Sure, they're going to take offense. That's what drove Lane Kirkland to say he'd abdicated his role as leader of the party. But he won. And uh, so they'll take offense, but where are they going to go? What about the fallout with Labor? What's, what's going to happen? Is, uh, is, is, is there going to be a grand reconciliation between Clinton and, and uh, Labor, or will it ever really be the same? Has the luster gone forever? Is, are the wounds too deep? Where was the luster? One of the, great myths, one of the great myths in this town is that Labor is in Bill Clinton's camp. During the primaries, they hated him. He was the anti-Labor, right-to-work, scab-inviting governor of Arkansas. <laughs> they wanted Tom Harkin, or after that, they would have taken anybody. But um, this is a marriage of convenience, and it will be again tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, the, the okay. other great myth is that anything is forever in Washington. Nothing is forever in Washington. And uh, people make up after all of these fights. But I think what Labor has, is, uh, has taught us is the flip side of what I said about Clinton, that they're weaker in a fight than people thought. Clinton's tougher in a fight than people thought. And I think the next time they go up against labor, I think they know that they can push him around a little bit. Is uh, Perot finished? I note that in a poll taken by uh, ABC Washington Post, the favorability rating on Ross Perot is 34%. The unfavorability rating is 55%. Very, very high negatives. I think those are the highest negatives that he's ever had. Mm -hmm. You think he's finished? I don't think he's finished, but I think this proves that he's in a box. He's in a 20% box right now, which is what he got in the last election. And I don't see that nothing in this fight he did gained him anybody. We'll be right back. Maybe Jesse Jackson. He was here the other night. He denied it flatly. Denied it flatly. Uh, Ralph Nader. What's Ralph Nader thinking of? He's very upset by this. Hey, how Are we going to rule hey, out the wedge potential of this hey, of How this many vote? elections have Ralph Nader and Ross Perot and Pat Buchanan won lately? Julie from Washington. Listen, there is going to be a split in the party. I've worked for the party. I worked for the people who are in, in the White House right now. And I tell you now, Clinton didn't win by a mandate. He was edged in because Ross Perot backboard George Bush out. Labor is not dead. We don't like what was done here. We're going to have a summit here in Washington in April. And, I, and believe you me, he can write all the letters he wants to, but no letter he writes to anyone in Congress will put him back in because he's out. And you know if, if, uh, if the economy uh, takes a tumble, uh, this is going to fortify well, Perot. It's going to fortify labor in their objections to what Clinton has done. Sure, the if the economy takes a tumble, it fortifies Perot, and the Democratic blue-collar workers abandon the party when it takes, uh, if the economy takes a tumble, they abandon. But Labor did this in 1980. They were mad at Jimmy Carter, and they fielded a candidate, and they got 12 years of Ronald Reagan, and they remember that. The emotions are very high right now, and you're going to have comments like Julie's, but I think over time, they're going to realize they have to make peace. You have uh, other odd wrinkles. For example, here's a poll conducted by uh, Field in California of Republicans and Democrats. <clears throat> and to, to determine whether Republicans or Democrats would be more inclined to re-elect a congressman who opposes NAFTA. More inclined to re-elect a congressman who opposes NAFTA. The Republicans would be 29% 20, uh, less inclined, 16% more inclined. Uh, you got it? <laughs> so, so, yeah. so isn't, isn't, isn't that... Isn't that fatal for Republicans, that they'd be more inclined to, uh, that, well, isn't that going to help the Democrats? Because look how many Republicans 
voted for NAFTA. Look, there is, there is no doubt that there's a difference in the intensity factor, and Julie, is, the caller, reflected that. There are people, I think wrongly, but there are people who believe that NAFTA is going to have an enormous impact on the employment of blue-collar workers. The Mexican economy is 3 or 4 percent of the American economy. It is never going to have anything like that kind of effect. But people are afraid, John, and people are frightened. But they're frightened of forces that are far beyond NAFTA. They're afraid of automation. They're afraid of global competition. They're afraid of defense cutbacks. That's what the emotions we saw tonight is all about. Much bigger picture than just NAFTA. Okay. I want, I want to restate the conclusions of Field. Field said that if you voted yes on NAFTA, 29 percent of Republicans would be more inclined to vote against you. So that's going to help the Democrats, because a lot of Republicans... That's a California to, number. I don't think that number will You don't think it nationally. can be extrapolated nationwide? Craig of Washington State. Craig? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, basically, I'm, I'm interested in to try to find out uh, what's the distinction with distinguish uh, numbers between uh, white-collar and blue-collar workers. Uh, for instance, in the short run, will blue-collar workers lose their jobs, and uh, perhaps the long run, we have a gain in white-collar workers uh, uh, gaining... Uh, jobs. Uh, nobody seems to distinguish this fact. It seems like um, it's just one, it's all balled up into one. Like, well, in the long run, we'll gain jobs. You want to comment on that? Steve? Well, I do think that uh, blue collar workers are more at risk, but the fact is they're more at risk anyway as a result of these economic trends I'm, I'm talking about. One member of Congress told me something very, very interesting tonight. He said, there really is a class distinction in terms of the people who are for or against NAFTA. He said, when I got a phone call, about NAFTA, it tended to be someone who was against it. When I got a fax, it was someone who was for it. <laughs> and so there really is a class I think the, the answer to the caller's question is that blue-collar workers are going to be hit initially more than white-collar workers. And this fax that I've received from Bill in Worcester, Ohio, seems to bear that out. He says, a Wall Street friend of mine told me investment capital is like electricity. It follows the path of least resistance. This NAFTA is good for Mexico, Wall Street, and American elites. The guy who puts the screws in the air conditioners or makes windshield wiper blades for GM cars, look out. That sucking sound isn't a Midwest twister, but our job's going south. Craig, uh, is Craig still there? Uh, Craig is gone. Um, what about any other, any, other, any other winners or losers here? Winner's Newt Gingrich. He proved he could deliver the votes. He's been a partisan firebrand. That's how he got his reputation. He wants to succeed Bob Michael as leader. To do that, he has to prove he can be a player, a bipartisan player sometimes, and a partisan other times. And today he proved that he can I, play when he has to. And I think another group that wins are the so-called New Democrats, the people who uh, say the Democratic Party has to loosen some of its ties, the traditional ties to labor, to special interest groups. Traditional and, Democrats took a bit of a beating. Uh, oh. Yes, I think that, uh, I've had, I talked to one Democrat tonight who said, this is going to be good for the party because it's going to hurt labor and break our dependency on it. So I think that whole group of Democrats and the more moderate, uh, who are much more favorable toward business than a lot of the traditional labor, big city Democrats were you gonna have say, won. Were you going to say something about labor? We've got 30 seconds. Well, I, th I, I was going to say something about the new Democrats. I mean, yes, overall they win, but you have people like Richard Gephardt, Jill Long of Indiana, uh, Dick Sweat of New Hampshire, who say they're Democratic Leadership Council members, new Democrats, yet they ran from the new Democrats on this vote. Uh, it's been a fast half hour. John King and Steve Roberts, thanks for being my guest. I hope we come back soon. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about APAC with two, two people who can really tell you about it. We'll be right back.